Steve, are you ready to start? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hi, good evening. My name is Nina Avenal, and I'm a senior coordinator here at IEA. Um, I want to welcome any new families to our community, but also express my gratitude for the familiar faces that I continually see at these events. Um, without your support, gifted support group meetings and also IEA events can't happen. So thank you for being here. And also to our online audience, thank you for um, joining us digitally. Um, so gifted support group meetings, if you haven't been to one yet, they were essentially developed as a way to provide um, parents and educators of gifted children um, an open and safe forum to uh, share their experiences and joys and challenges of uh, working with or raising a gifted child. It's also an opportunity for you to learn from experts in the field who are so willing to share their knowledge about working with gifted children. Um, these gifted support group meetings are hosted once a month with a new speaker and topic every single month. Um, we are also now live streaming our gifted support group meetings because there's a lot of non-local families who want to learn and want to attend, but they can't. So we do have an online audience joining us tonight. They'll have on access to the presentation, we'll also be able to see Dr. Palmer. Um, so without further ado, I do want to introduce Dr. Dave Palmer, who is a licensed educational psychologist. He's an award-winning researcher and also university lecturer. Um, he will be discussing giftedness identification and IQ testing. So Dr. Palmer, thank you so much. So I push this button here down and tell something You're good to go, yes. Is it good? Yes. All right, so sure. Hi. Um, have I worked with any parents here? Yeah. And I know Sharon Duncan from Gifted Identity is a consultant. Okay. Um, I am David Palmer and I have a private practice and my private practice is in Laguna Beach. Um, a bit of a drive, but I do get a lot of clients from Los Angeles and further out. I also have a book out, um, it was 2006, I think, or seven. Um, um, a basic kind of introduction to IQ testing and gifted programming, and an introduction to various traits of gifted kids. It's kind of a, a primer book, you know, you kind of go from there into more detail. <coughs> trying to revise it, have been for years, but uh, I haven't had time to sit down and actually put it all together. I hope to do that someday soon. Um, I've been a teacher, I've been a university lecturer, I've been a researcher. I spend most of my time. I have spent most of my time as an educational psychologist working with kids with disabilities. So, learning disabilities, uh, emotional issues, and autism, uh, intellectual uh, deficits, those type of things. But I noticed early on when I was an educational psychologist in the public schools that I would have parents and other fellow teachers asking me about gifted education and how do I get my child assessed. So I started assessing kids um, and then exploring, well, what's out there for these kids? And eventually I opened up the private practice after I researched and put some information in this book. Opened up the private practice, and this has been about eight, nine years that I've been doing this. Um, let's see if this works. Um, press it down. Okay, press it down. Okay. <laughs> Hold it down and then I push it up between. Okay. The down button. The down button. Yes. Makes it go yes. Forward. Okay. okay, so we're going to do uh, an overview of different topics during the presentation. I'd rather have it be more like a discussion. So you know, ask questions or add something in or ask for clarifications as you need to as we go along. And then at the end, if there's any questions, I'll we'll take those as well, or you can be with me personally. So we're going to talk about broadly, what is intelligence and what is IQ? Those two things are not the same thing, of course. Uh, we're going to look at some traits of gifted learners, including that, looking at some possible we call them negative or flip side traits of having an IQ that's high or exceptionally high. We'll, we'll look at an uh, overview of programming options for um, kids at diff different levels of giftedness, what typically I recommend for, for this kids. We'll look at the question of misdiagnosis and dual diagnosis of gifted kids and adults because this is very, I find it very common. I uh, often get kids in to my office who were referred by a doctor 
or the parent, the doctor told the parent, you know, get your child checked out for giftedness because, you know, I don't think they're ADHD or autistic spectrum. Um, a lot of the traits of giftedness in some kids are very similar to the traits of some of these you know, disorders, personality issues, social issues, attentional issues. I always like to look for the, you know, let's, let, let's not look at it as a problem first, let's get some more information to see if there's something else going on that we could use to address that behavior before we start looking at therapy or medication or something like that. I've taken a lot of kids off of labels um, as a private practitioner, but probably even more so in the public schools. It's, it's fairly common that you get kids that are misdiagnosed because they're not in the right placement. I'll share a few books that I have found to be, you know, interesting that might be helpful for you as well. Okay, I'm going to start. So, briefly, to introduce myself again, I have two kids. This is my son when he was about 15 and just starting to get into bands. And his <laughs> friend took that picture. Now he's 25 and has a beard and short hair and he's a banker. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly thought he was going to be in a rock band for like five years before I went to college, but a series of events. No, I can't believe what's going on. Now he's different from here. I wish I had an after picture. <laughs> but I like this too. You know, it was very uh, creative and still is. I have a second um, child. Ari, the boy you saw, is our biological child. And we had we had secondary infertility. So we waited a bit, you know, before we had kids. Had a hard time uh, getting pregnant again. So we looked at adoption. Another long story. I'll make it very short. <clears throat> is we finally decided to adopt overseas um, or look at that option. We found this one uh, girl in Bulgaria who was five at the time and went there. And this is her in the orphanage that we visited Aww. when she was five. There's Pavlina, still is Pavlina. She's now 24 and in Colorado trying to get in nursing school. A lot has happened there. That's, that's in the orphanage as well. And that's them when they were both about 15. <laughs> that's a few years ago. I play some guitar. I don't play very well, but I've you know, played since I was 10 or so. Took lessons at the YMCA and uh, learned some on my own. My son got older. I wanted him to have a musical instrument. So I always liked jazz, so I kind of pushed for him to take jazz saxophone and piano. Well, he first took a little piano, kind of like that. Jazz saxophone, never really into it. You know, I tried to get him private lessons. Never kind of click with him. And he picked up a guitar and he went all over it, you know, surpassed me literally I mean, within three months. He's way better than I. There's him and his buddies playing in front of a convenience store in their neighborhood. <laughs> they did this together themselves, you know. They wrote some songs. It's actually pretty good. Again, this guy right here. This banker with the. <laughs> Just a little back now. We're going to go into the presentation. So, what is IQ? Um, it certainly doesn't mean, it's not the same as saying what is intelligence, right? IQ means intelligence quotient. It's basically a number that you get when you take a test, called an IQ test. Um, the older test, prior to the early 70s, used to actually use quotients to um, derive the scores. Uh, you divide one, you know, your, your, your age over another formula and you get a number and that's your IQ. They found, though, that that was very inaccurate for certain kids. It tended to skew the scores tremendously for kids of certain ages. Um, it wasn't very useful. So they changed the way they looked for IQ by using standardized tests, using the normal curve rather than this um, IQ ratio score. Yet we still call the scores an IQ test, IQs, even though they don't involve quotients. So then if an IQ does not mean you know, intelligence directly, it certainly is tapping into some aspects of intelligence. So what is intelligence? I teach a, an online course now for teachers seeking their GATE certification, you know, their GATE and talented certification, uh, teaching those kids in a uh, centralized classroom. Let me ask that question, you know, what is that intelligence? Um, it depends, really, on what's important for you. That person and that person's society or surrounding at the time. I get, you get different answers from different people and, and from different cultures. 
Most of you, I'm sure, know about, um, oops, there it goes. Um, Howard Gardner's Multiple Intelligences. He's one of the researchers. He's a researcher at Harvard that came out with a book based on what he found when he looked into uh, the anatomy of the brain and studying uh, how uh, brain surgeons would, you know, uh, sever a part of the brain and then part of your, uh, what you can do was diminished or enhanced, you know, if, if, you, if you cut here this part of the brain, then your verbal uh, abilities diminish. If you cut here, your ability to distinguish tones, music, musical tones diminish. If you get here, you can no, no longer socially, you know, connect with people. So I said, well, if that's true, if there are actually distinct parts of the brain that deal with these things that we often think of as abilities or intelligence, then why not call those things intelligences as well? The distinct areas of the brain, there's some evidence that those are real things, not just manifestations of our thought process. So he came up with seven different types of intelligences. The first two on his list are what IQ tests typically test. So the pictures represent these seven aspects of intelligence as Howard Gardner laid them out. Now there could be many, many more, right? There could be hundreds of types of intelligences. In fact, some researchers have you know, developed such lists. His seven were verbal intelligence, I chose this picture, ability to kind of connect with people verbally and understand what they're saying and communicate. Another one is he called logical mathematical intelligence. So the uh, ability to reason basically. Right? So you have language skills, the ability to reason and problem solve using language, speaking and listening, and then the ability to problem solve reason with symbols, mathematical symbols, visual images, that kind of thing. So those are the two uh, types of intelligences that IQ tests mainly tap into. But he also identified other intelligences, which some people would call talents or abilities. Um, this is visual, spatial, artistic ability. Now, it's interesting to look at that because I think most of us know young kids that are really good at something, right? And maybe they haven't had a lot of training in it. They just seem to take to, like my son with the guitar, right? Some kids with the piano or some kids grow up singing and they can do perfect pitch and you and I may never be able to do that, no, no matter how hard we practice. Other kids, like this girl, I forgot her name, but she was quite famous at one time, would do paintings and, you know, at a very early age that would rival you know, adults that have been doing this for many years. So why is that? Uh, again, this is one of the reasons Gardner came up with this idea. Well, it must be that some of us are born with certain abilities that are very distinct, right? But just because that, just because you are, appear to be born with this innate music ability or artistic ability or other ability doesn't mean you're going to be good in anything else, right? You can be a great musician, but maybe not so good in reasoning and with one language. Or you can be great at math, but not so good with social skills, that kind of thing. I myself, I think I'm pretty good with verbal areas, but I'm not very good at math. I got to struggle with it. I have to really study. Some people pick it up like that, but I don't. So, you no, know, that's one of my, you know, weak areas. I think one of my stronger is, uh, is verbal. Bodily kinesthetics, we also call this an intelligence. The highest level of people in all sports, Olympic athletes and NFL players, that's not just training. You know, they had to start with some innate ability. I believe it's hard to get that far with just training. Musical ability, he also identified. This one is interpersonal. So the ability to get along with other people. So this might be, you know, all else being equal, if you have a reasonable ability to problem solve, this might be one of the one of the or the most important type of intelligence or ability that allows you to succeed. However, you want to identify that in the world, in a job, or in a family, or in relationships, right? The ability to read other people, get along with them, connect with them, influence them interpersonal intelligence, very important. IQ tests, you know, don't tap into this at all, or nor musical ability, nor bodily kinesthetic ability. Um, or, um, this is intrapersonal. That's another one of his uh, intelligence. The ability to kind of look in yourself and stop and, and, you know, look within 
and understand yourself, basically. People that are good at meditation, I suppose, would be a good place. People that can sit and reflect rather than react. I have a real hard time doing that. I'm trying. You know, I've taken TM courses, Transcendental Meditation. I'm going to try to get back into it, but I'm too <laughs> active all the time. It's one of my goals. But I think it's important, like these abilities, including this one, again, not testing on an IQ test, which the last one you put in there was naturalistic intelligence, the ability to connect with and understand nature. And then he added a couple more in there where he's talking about doing one's ex existential or spiritual intelligence, one is moral intelligence. And you probably have heard of other authors, uh, Daniel Coleman, I think it is, or Goleman, who wrote a book on emotional intelligence. So there are different ways of looking at this question. The main point being that IQ tests just look at a very narrow band of abilities, mostly those abilities that are important for academic learning. You can have a very high IQ, but not do very well, even if you try in a social situation or maybe in a job situation that requires you to lead other people, right? You can have a kind of an average high, average IQ, but really good skills and intrapersonal, interpersonal, and do really well. So it, it's, it's an interdependent. IQ is one piece of information, it's one piece of the puzzle. It's an important piece of the puzzle, particularly for academic studies, but it's not everything, it's the main thing. So we know that IQ tests don't measure everything. What do they measure? Those first two uh, domains in Howard Gardner's uh, multiple intelligences. So verbal reasoning, ability to use words to understand concepts and explain concepts and your vocabulary, basically. And visual, spatial, or perceptual reasoning ability to solve problems when you're looking at puzzles or visual information. So those are the two main aspects of reasoning that IQ, all IQ tests look into. The more modern IQ tests, the ones that have been revised over the last few years, they break down visual, spatial, a little bit more, the WISC-5, the one that I primarily use, the most recent edition of the Weschler that has a separate component called visual spatial reasoning. It just has to do with like block design and puzzle group, those type of things. These other two things are also tested on most IQ tests, comprehensive IQ tests. The two most common are the WISC, the Western Intelligence Delta for Children. Currently, the fifth edition is the most um, is the most recent edition. And the Stanford Binet 5. They all test, they both test these two things. Working memory. It's a version of short-term memory, we'll talk about it in a minute, where you're listening or seeing something, you put it in here, you do something with it for a while, and you get it back out. Now, you can have very high reasoning skills and, and, and relatively lower average or skills in these areas, I'm sorry, working memory and or processing speed. Processing speed is supposed to be a measure of how quickly we process information in our minds and react. The kind of tests, though, that are used on IQ tests to look at that question, to me, they're not very, uh, are not always valid. So there are a lot of things that other uh, conditions that can influence a person's performance on a processing speed test in a IQ test rather than cognitive processing speed. So again, reasoning. That's what I you know, what we, when we think of IQ, we think of problem solving reasoning. And these two other things, memory and processing speed. How quickly can we react move on? That's what an IQ test is composed of. When you take an IQ test, you might just get one score, you get a whole bunch of different scores. Scaled scores, five or six, usually sometimes seven or eight, and subtest scores, individual test scores. On the WISP, for example, there's two subtests to derive each of the scale so there's a verbal reasoning scale and that's derived by looking at the performance on two different subtests there's a perceptual reasoning scale and that's derived from two subtests so 10 to 12 subtests typically five to eight or so scales okay so i won't go into you know giving you examples of all of those different um, intelligences or abilities that are measured on an iq test but to give you an example of what it's like to be tested on an IQ test in the area of short-term memory, or now we call it more working memory, we'll do something. 
So I'm going to say say some words. Just try to remember the words in your mind. Um, and then when I say to repeat the words, just repeat the words in your mind. You're not saying it out loud. If you want to whisper, that's okay. Most adults can remember seven different pieces of information with growth and a relative ease. They can remember six. That's pretty good too, I guess. And more, that's good. But uh, this is this is short-term memory, which is what used to be tested on IQ test until 10, 15 years ago. Now they're testing what's called working memory. But anyhow, here's an example of short-term memory. Okay, so I'm going to say some words, and then I'm going to just be quiet for about 10 seconds. Try to repeat the words in your head in the order that I um, said them. After I am done saying the words, take a couple seconds, pause, and repeat them back in your head, or you can whisper them. And then I'll put the words on the screen, and you can see if you were right. This shouldn't be real hard. Okay, um, there you go. Carrot, peach, apple. Oh, I'm starting with. <laughs> I was doing the wrong list. <laughs> okay, here we go. Erase that. Here we go. Apple, banana, pear, grape, mango, apricot, peach. You can see if you were able to remember those seven words in that sequence, right? So that's short-term memory, just getting something in and getting it back out. But working memory, which is IQ tests are revised every five to eight years, I think, based on research in cognitive psychology, and they use subcultural factor analysis to break down these areas they look at into, they try to kind of hone, you know, what they're looking at. So right now, the, one of the important things we look at is called working memory. And now it's not just put it in here and get it back out, it's put it in here, do something with it, and get it back out. So I'm going to say a list of words, and when I finish, instead of just repeating them like I said them, you in your mind, or if you want to whisper, or if you can write it down, I got and so on. Um, instead of saying them in the same order that I said them, say them by listing all the fruits first in alphabetical order, and then all the vegetables in alphabetical order. So I'm going to say, a group of words, some are fruit, fruit, some are vegetables. You hear it in your mind, say, okay, I'm going to repeat back in my mind that list, but I'm going to first repeat all the fruits in alphabetical order, and then all the vegetables in alphabetical order. All right, so here we go. Carrot, peach, apple, celery, banana, broccoli. Okay, so the correct response was apple, banana, peach. Broccoli, carrot, celery. Can you kind of feel your mind working there? Right. So that's working memory, right? You're not just spitting something back out, but you're doing something with it before you spit it back out. So that's one of the things that is assessed on all modern IQ tests now. And you can see why it's important for school too, right? Because we're always listening to the teacher and try to figure things out and come up with an explanation, get it back out. And the other is, of course, verbal is very important for school. Verbal is the most, the score, that you get an IQ test that's the most correlated, highly correlated with academic testing because school is so verbally loaded. We listen, we speak, we write. Yes. What kind of um, age ranges and what different kind of tests are there like something like that? Um, well, instituted on personally, I mean, you can get IQ tests that go down to about well, one and a half, two right. and a half. Um, I don't do but that. I would be able to do that. If I get a, if I get a client that asks, yeah, I'm very precocious, you know, toddler, at two and a half or three. And they list, you know, what they're doing. Yeah, you have there's a lot of evidence the child is, you know, precocious and it probably is gifted, but I don't recommend testing typically until at least age four and a half. And I like to wait later if possible. Um, I don't mind testing at four and a half if they're about to go into school. It depends. When do you need the information, right? 
and for what reason. Now, I will test somebody earlier than four and a half, and even down to three years old, if it's for a different reason, like differential diagnosis, because we talked briefly about some gifted kids are misdiagnosed, have an emotional problem or a social problem or an intentional problem. Well, let's do an IQ test and see if it's pretty high, then hey, maybe that's what it is. They need more stimulation, they need a different type of environment, and put them in that type of environment, see if those characteristics diminish, and that's part of the differential diagnosis. Diagnosis. Instead of saying, here's some pills, uh, you know, they quiet it down, that's good. Let's try this other thing first. Not to say that, you know, other therapies and the medication are wrong, but I always like to look at, um, you know, the, the, the least uh, problematic reason for something going on before you go to the disorder. Um, uh, most gifted or many gifted programs that I, I'm not sure what the, um, IEA, when, when did they start working with you? Oh, I still test in third grade. Oh, okay, so third, yeah. So most of the programs I refer to start at, you know, at five. Some of them start to seven or eight, but you're right in public school, it's mostly third grade. But there are other programs out there for kids as early as five years old and summer camps and that kind of thing. And so I do test, again, as early as four and a half. If the parents can wait, if they have time before the child starts school or before they try to enroll the child in a program, at age five, I asked them to wait, just because it's easier for me too, right? It's, I mean, most three and a half and four year olds do not want to sit in a chair for an hour and a half and play games. Even though, very, very rarely, I've done this for many years, I'm almost always get, able to get kids engaged, like pretty quickly, the way I, I have kaleidoscopes and robot things on my desk and we play and then we get into it. So they think it, the whole thing's a game. Um, and it's very engaging for most of them, um, because they're rarely challenged and when they come to me. They're challenged, and this is, you know, well, I'm doing something, they're asking me to do something that's kind of interesting, but I can't quite do it. And so it, 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 they get the sense of that they rarely get that they're, they're using their capacities, you know, they're being asked to do that, and they rarely are able to do that. Thank you for asking the question. Any other questions that you want to ask as we go along, please do that because you might forget them today. Okay, so IQ tests and IQ scores, we'll briefly look at that. So, question. There are two main types of IQ tests. There are group tests. Um, most schools get group, group tests for their gifted education programs. And as I mentioned, public schools typically have these programs starting in third grade. Pasadena is a little different. But there's a lot of, uh, well, there's some difference between different districts. So they'll get the OLSAT, for example, but the Maglieri. The OSAT has both verbal and perceptual items on it. It takes about 30 minutes, but anybody can give it, and it's a paper and pencil test, and you give it in a big group of 10 or 20, 30 kids. And they are good screening tests, and they are correlated mostly. They're correlated pretty well with actual IQ tests that are individually administered that take about two hours to give, and there's so much they're monitoring to make, the, make sure the child is you know, paying attention and engaging the child. But group tests, I and mean, you can't give an IQ test to every child in school, and I see why they do that. Now, as an educational psychologist in the district I was in in Fullerton, my district there did what many districts used to do. They did a screening test with an IQ test, and they might have had some other screening criteria, teacher recommendation, parent interest, and those kids that passed the screening test would go on to an individual test. I used to go on Saturdays and give these tests to kids you know, uh, all day long. But now, because of budget cuts, they said, you know, I don't know of any district that, that's doing that anymore. Um, another side note is that usually, or typically, when a child was tested for special education, if there was an educational problem, almost always they would be given a comprehensive IQ test in the schools um, as part of what's called a psychoeducational assessment where you're looking for a learning disability. Now that has changed because in the schools, we're using what's called a PSW, Process Strength and Weaknesses Model, instead of the model we used a few years ago, which is called the Significant Discrepancy Model. In the Significant Discrepancy Model, we take the IQ score and say, that's a predictor of how they're going to do academically. And it is. It's a crude predictor. If you have an IQ of 100, exactly average, you should pretty much do average in school, not grade level. My IQ 130, boy, we'd expect to be two, three years above grade level. And that usually plays out. IQ of 70, we expect you to struggle. That usually plays out. So with a significant discrepancy model, 
hey, your IQ is 120, but boy, your academics are 85. Something's going on. There's a big difference, a significant discrepancy between what you're doing here academically and what you should be able to do. Let's find the reason for that. Let's look at memory, attention, visual processing, language processing. And if we, if we can find a discrepancy and find the reason and rule out other things, like you haven't been to school or you weren't trying, then we'll say you have a learning disability and give you services. Now with the process strengths and weaknesses model, they don't have to give, and they rarely give, a comprehensive IQ test. They just get bits and pieces of it. Uh, whether or not that's better or worse, you know, it's still being determined. It's kind of in the first two or three years of this, and I think it's more gray, but there's positives and negatives to that. So most kids that get into public school gate programming gifted will take a group test. Um, none of the programs I refer to though will accept those tests. They're good as mass screeners, but they're not as valid or reliable as an individual administered test. And the higher your IQ, the more likely it is you'll be missed on a group test. Yes? I'm sorry, so I just kind of want to understand. So you would get in a group test, like, so I understand the ALSA, like, they have the paper and pencil. And then, like, on the Saturday when you would test them, would you give them? Like, I, would give, I would sit down with them individually. Oh, individually. And test them one-on-one -on -one takes about an hour and a half. For each child? Yes. And that's why they stopped doing it, because it's expensive. Okay. They'd use their own psychologist, typically, but they have to get them in on the weekends. Because I was just curious that um, we got a letter and they said it would take a half an hour, and it was a group test on Saturdays. Yeah, that, that was one of the group tests that was given in a group of five or ten or twenty or whatever. They got like. it. Got it. Yeah. it. used to be that districts would take the kids that passed that test and then give them the actual test, the IQ test, that is considered more valid and reliable. But again, it's too much time and too much money. I'm sorry, uh, am I being still... I'm sorry, am I yes. still being... Okay, yes. so I was standing over here. Can you see if I'm... Yes. Oh, okay, good. Just let me know. Okay. <laughs> Are there any other questions before we go on? So, the, the comprehensive tests that are individually administered take about an hour and a half, give or take 15 minutes to, develop, um, to administer. The two most common are the WISC-5 and the Stanford MNA-5, but there are other tests out there. Um, some of them are more uh, suited, I think, for The medical reasons, like looking at looking for brain damage, that type of thing. I think the two that are most suited for educational purposes are these two. And I like the WISP 5 over the Stanford MNA. I'm sorry, the WISP 5 over the Stanford MNA 5 because the WISP 5 more clearly delineates verbal reasoning skills over versus perceptual. So it's well known that most kids and adults that when you take an IQ test, they're scattered. You know, you're out of here, you're not out of here, you're out of here. Um, and many or most gifted kids are not gifted in both verbal and perceptual, but one or the other. So you can have an IQ of 140 in verbal and 123 in perceptual. Your full scale still might be 132 or something. You're gifted, but you're significantly higher in verbal. So the WISC-5 is able to show that with a Stanford Binet kind of merges them together so you get the same basic full scale score but you don't see the difference between the verbal and perceptual as much which is important because most pro all programs that I refer to and I'll get to this when we talk about programs they won't just look at the full scale score the overall score they'll look at one of they'll say well do you have this cutoff score which is typically 124 90 percent up in the full scale no, okay, do you have it in the verbal? No, okay, do you have it in the perceptual? No, how about the general ability index? There's five or six of them to look at, right? Because most gifted kids don't score gifted in the gifted range, whatever you want to call that, in all those areas. It might be in one or two areas. And again, the WISC-5 is able to capture that. Um, yes? What are the reasons that the group school um, tests are not as valid? Like, what, what is the... Well, they don't have as many um, items on them. Uh, the kids aren't monitored. Uh, as I said, open your pencil, you have 30 minutes. The teacher walks around. A lot of kids don't finish them. They don't know the importance of them. You, they're not able to circle back. And let's take another look at this one. They seem distracted. Um, so that, that probably has to be the validity of the test. So they typically do worse on the test than they could? Well, no, I would say, I would say with the group 
test. They're a good instrument for most gifted kids. And the, the score you get on a group test is highly correlated typically with most gifted kids that are that score in kind of the middle of giftedness. But if you get some kids that are you know, way up high on an individual test, those kids are more likely to be missed on uh, this test. Those, you can score 145 an individual, maybe 129 on that OSAP. But if you a child that's going to get a 130, let's say, on an individual test, you'll probably get or 125 about the same score on a group test. So the more outside the norm you are, the more likely it is that you, your score will not be as identical as we would like if you were to be administered with individual test. Any other questions so far? I have a question. Yes. Would there be any other way to, okay, this is not gonna make sense, but to determine giftedness without testing? Well, that's a good question because some people do that it's qualitative assessment. Um, it is messy, um, but yes, I mean, again, we go back to the question, what is giftedness, right? And you, you could certainly have portfolios. Um, let's see what you've done, observation, uh, performance. Those are called qualitative measures. They're very valid, particularly for abilities like musical, like kinesthetic, interpersonal. You know, how do you perform? You know, what do you gravitate towards? Um, some psychologists like Lynn Silverman, who many of you know from Colorado, interesting story. Does anyone know Lynn Silverman, Colorado Gift Development Center? They didn't go oh, that way to her. Okay. About her. She's, yeah. I think she's still, she's still there. Okay. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Synchronicity, right? Things happen for a reason. Uh, remind me of your question. I'll forget about it. I was in uh, Colorado for some conference. And I was looking at real estate to an apartment or something. And I went to one that was for sale, because I do that on the site. And uh, let's go back and look at the carriage house. The carriage house, get the development center, you know. I, and I was writing a book at the time, and I didn't know. Uh, this is, uh, and she wasn't there at the time, but <laughs> interesting. Uh, what's the chance of that? Really? But uh, she does that, I think, as, as an adjunct. And, um, there's some psychologists in, in LA that do that as well, which I think is a fine thing, but it takes a lot of money and there's a lot of subjectivity to it, and there's a lot of you know interpretation to it, and whether or not it is you know can you, to validate or invalidate what you're seeing, perhaps. But I don't do it. Um, I think again for time and cost, you know, and the fact that. Programs I refer to, they want that score, but they will take other things sometimes if the score isn't quite there that you can derive from the portfolio performance and stuff like that. But yes, when you say how else to assess giftedness, you have to go back to what is giftedness, what is intelligence. Well, this is the only this this is a very crude test and it's not perfect, but it's the best thing we have to predict academic achievement at least, all else being equal. Thank you. So the um, modern tests, as opposed to the old, older tests, like the Stanford Binet, the original one, LM, it was called the Stanford Binet LM, that used uh, ratio scores, derived quotients. All the new ones uh, base their scores on the normal curve. So the normal curve, as I'm sure you know, it's like a law of nature. It's weird. It, it, you see it all over the place, right? It's the wine bottle. So if you take um, like heights of women in the United States or um, the exact number of leaves on a sycamore tree in autumn, and you counted those things, you know, and had a big sample, you know, it's a few thousand, and you put it down here, you could see in the middle, gee, most women in that country, in that region at, at this age, are five foot four inches. Or, you know, there's a lot of them right there. But you know, as we get away from the, the median, the mean, to say, um, there's fewer people that are five foot five, and fewer that are five foot six, and fewer that are five foot eight, and very few that are six foot two, and you know, very very few is six foot seven, and there's some way way over here that there's you know, seven feet four, you know, one fraction of one percent, same exact same dynamic the other way, right? So. 
I think almost everything in nature, if you look at it from a certain angle, follows this law of nature, including our abilities that are assessed by this crude test that we're talking about right here, the IQ test. Um, about 68% of us fall in this plus one, a minus one standard deviation average difference. So 100 is the exact average score on an IQ test on a, and on most educational tests. Right at the 50th percentile, 50% 50 of us don't do as well, 50% of us do better. But the farther away we get from the mean, from the average score, the fewer and fewer people will show that ability, or fewer and fewer people will be that height, or there'll be fewer and fewer trees that have that number of leaves on them. Um, so, somewhere down the line, and I've asked, often asked this question, well, who determined one third of the right? Or well, who determined where to put these breakers, right? And there, that is, there is a mathematical way to look at that, but it, there's some subjectivity to it. But the way we look at it now and have for many years is, well, I keep getting the movie, but um, I'm going to try to move this. What time did it? was supposed to be at it? Seven. 30 or 7? Well, what time typically do we? Usually Okay. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to go through it. Um, what was I saying? Laws of nature. Okay, so yes. All right, so it used to be an IQ of 85 would, you would be called mentally retarded. That was the term in the 70s. Yeah, now it's intellectual deficiency. I'm not sure what's better. Now it's, it was a big um, law suit. Now, now let's not call it one standard deviation, standard, devi standard deviation below. Let's call it two, let's say 70 now. Because what was happening is you were capturing a lot of kids with an IQ around there. Some of them were mistested because tests are not perfect. Being called mentally retarded, putting these classes and being left there and never get, being given a chance to get out, get, get out. So there were lawsuits. And because of those lawsuits, uh, Psychological Association um, changed that criteria to seven. Well, this that's two standard deviations, right? 15 times 2, 30, so 100 minus 37. Two standard deviations above, the mean is 130. So most people consider 130 as the market for giftedness, right? Either the top 2% or bottom 2%. So that's, you know, kind of how we interpret scores. I'll go over some more of that. Yes? Um, if you um, administer a test when a child is like five, let's say, how many point deviation would you expect if you were to re-administer that test later question. on? Yeah, not many. Um, not more than five to eight. Usually it's less than that. Five, you ever take one or two. If you do it right and you do it, the, the later you do it, the more stable it is. That's why one reason I don't like to do it before four and a half. IQ is fairly stable at four and a half. Stabilizes more and more through eight or nine. Um, five to eight points. I've re-administered tests over seven years many times to kids, and I, I find that pattern a couple of times I'm surprised you know, that I get a huge difference. Well, I'm saying, I, I just remember one time, I'm saying one time, a boy with disability, uh, I, he brought in five or six. He had some, I think it's some anoxia, anoxia, some lack of action at birth. His IQ, I'm forgetting the exact number, let's say it was 100 in the average. Brought him in three years later after some therapies, you know, I was probably shouldn't have been skeptical, I mean, not in a bad way, but no, in fact, I changed it. I'll test him again just to know. That was baseline. And he went up like 20 points or something. That was very, you know, it was, it's not the same test. It wasn't a practice effect. You know, I'm good at determining if they've prepped for the test. So sometimes you were surprised, but that was probably an anomaly because he had some physical things and some, you know, gets delays that were not because of what's in here, but because he wasn't hearing properly when he was younger and then he caught up. But yeah, typically not more than three to five points, five to eight at the outside, typically. Okay, so what do IQ scores mean? Uh, so there's no universal definition for what to call these scores, but 130 or above is often called very superior or gifted, about 2% of people score that high, kids and adults. 120 to 129 is often called superior. 110 to 119, high average. 90 to 109, average. 89, 80 to 89, low average. 70 to 79, borderline delayed. And 69 below delayed. Um, 
So it does tell you a lot. You know, you, you do you know, I used to teach, teach as well. If you have someone down here, it's going to going to need a much different educational program than someone up here. And they're going to go crazy if you try to teach this one at this level and vice versa, right? Some people need remediation. Some people need acceleration or enrichment. And an IQ test is one way to objectively look at that question. So normal curve and program criteria. Most of the exact score is 100. Most programs I refer to want a 124, 95th percentile, top 5%. Summer Institute for Gifted is one. Uh, there's UCI has some programs. Uh, Johns Hopkins is another that will we'll take that, and several other programs. One on 124. Schools usually one on 130, as mentioned. But many schools will take kids below 130, 125, 128, everything else looks good. So on the old IQ test, this is where some confusion comes in. And Linda Silverman has written about this. And she used to, used to, 10 years ago, still use the LM as a supplementary test to, this, to the modern test. I'm not sure if she still does that. I don't do that. Um, but the older ratios, 130 to 144, the older test, what you call moderately gifted, 145 to 159, highly gifted, 160 to 179, exceptionally gifted, 180 and above, profoundly gifted. Well, we don't get scores of 180 or above anymore because of that quotient score, the ratio scores, almost impossible. Because now with the normal curve test, the modern test, the scores are much tighter. So now, 130 to 137 is often called gifted or very superior. 138 to 144 is often called highly gifted. 145 to 151 is often called exceptionally gifted. 152 and above is often called profoundly gifted. Now, on some of the tests like the WISP-5, we can get scores above 160. All the tests that I know of top out at 160, but the WISP-5 has supplementary scales that you can use. If a person has topped out on two or more subtests, you can use a supplementary scale. Give some additional testing to get scores above 160. I did. I find that once in a while. I think I've had a few 170s, 172, and one area of verbal. So we can do that. Okay, what's the optimal IQ? Well, you know, if, if you're happy, you know, your IQ is fine. Then that's optimal. But what's the optimal IQ for academics or for you know getting through in life and doing what you want to do? Right? All else being equal, all else is never never equal. But let's pretend it is. Probably, and there's no hard research on this, but it's a very hard question to research, right? But this is also kind of intuitive. Yeah, 115 or so to maybe 145. That's, all, that's a big range. But then you have all of the cognitive ability you need to do whatever you want academically. You learn quickly. You know, you, you process information quickly. But you're not so different from everyone else that you might have other problems that come along with being so different from everyone. You know, I'm going to skip a few things if I may, because we yeah. can So, the gifted kids have some common traits, but I, I always look at this first. This is also true that if you look at elementary age kids from kindergarten to sixth grade, and you measure on the spread of their hand, the distance between this, the pinky, fingertip, and the thumb, there's a very strong correlation between the length of that line and reading ability. <laughs> now, why? Somebody's going to know why I'm saying this. Why am I saying? Hmm? No. Element because yes. No. Oh. <laughs> That's because uh, this is why this is called spurious correlation, right? Just because their things are correlated, don't does not mean that one thing is causing the other, right? Because kindergarten has smaller hands than sixth grade. That's why. Understand? Kindergartners have smaller hands than sixth graders. So kindergartners can't read as well as sixth graders. So there's a strong correlation between an elementary age kids between the length of the size of their hand and reading ability. Okay. Now if we didn't think that through, we say, well, gee, kids with big hands are good readers. So that must be you got a big hand, so you must be gonna be a good reader. No, that it's correlated, but it's correlated for a different reason. You know what I'm saying? There's a correlation, but it's, that correlation doesn't mean causation. That thing didn't cause the other thing. When I go through these traits, don't say IQ is everything either, right? You can have some of these traits or not have some of them. 
And if you have or don't have, it doesn't mean necessarily it's, it's relevant with, with your IQ. But I'll go over some traits that are more common among gifted kids. Learning traits, master's academic skills, basically like that's the most obvious one. Or in a specific area, again, I wasn't good in math, I never will be, but I was good in other things. Um, I'm sure that you couldn't identify with yourself what you were really good at, and it comes easy to you, but other things are not so easy. Truly enjoys the process of learning in the area of interest, but maybe not so much in the areas that they're not interested in. That's very common. They're able to really focus, hyper-focus on something that they're interested in, but not so much that they're not interested in. Because really, what I test kids too, when I find out where their strengths are, some of them have very significant strength in one area and not the other, the parents go, oh yeah, that's because, oh yeah, I see them gravitating toward that all the time, right? Oh, we like to do puzzles all the time. Why is that? Well, gee, he's got a really good spatial visual awareness. Of that. So we, we, as adults and kids, tend to gravitate towards things that complement our strengths. A deeper level of understanding than age peers. A high activity level, this is very common. Particularly in boys. Boys have more of these issues than girls. Nobody knows why. Some people call it testosterone damage. That's the why. Yeah. Chromosome, yes. It's a chromosome. More learning traits. Early talkers, some of them, not all of them, right? I think some people, Swimmer Einstein didn't talk to LA, for example. There's different theories about that. They don't need much repetition. In fact, they don't like repetition. I've heard that before. Let's go on. Block it out. They self-teach themselves. You know, a lot of kids, they just, school is, they're not really learning much, but they're kind of thinking in their head or they're going on the internet or they're reading books at home all the time. But most of their education is right there. They're great and solve probably, and they may prefer learning alone. Some people love learning in a group. I hated it as a college student. That's, you know, I would rather lock myself in a closet with a book and just, you know, other people are distracting to me. You may have a very different way of learning. Um, common social traits, so that's Bill um, Gates, who was arrested, that's his actual mugshot. <laughs> advanced sense of humor, so sometimes way advanced, right? They can very near understanding adult jokes, so if you, you have to watch what you say about kids sometimes. I hear that all the time from parents. You think it's going to go over their head, it doesn't. Now, this is another interesting one. It's a good a sign that your child might be cognitively advance if he or she prefers to hang out with older kids and or adults for conversation because they can't really connect with other kids their age that's a good sign that you know maybe they're thinking differently than most kids in their age band and a good reason to consider some gifted programming so they can hang out with other kids their age that thinks like them or get the program where they can hang out with kids no matter what the age is not an age-based program or a grade based program but an interest-based program as long as the which are relatively sensitive. Can be very sensitive. Why is that? We don't know. There's something called Dubrovsky sensitivities. There's all kinds of theories. If you're gifted, you might have more neurons or neural connections and they're firing more, more quickly and they're more tightly packed. And so that leads you to be, uh, to learn more quickly, but um, also maybe leads to have more meltdowns. You can be emotionally sensitive or empathetic or too empathetic to other people. You feel it, right? And I see this all the time as well. High, energy, high levels of energy, passion, emotional need, quirkiness may turn off others. This is particularly true when they're younger because they don't have coping skills. So they have all these connections, but they don't know what to do with them, and so they get in trouble a lot. And when they get to be seven or eight or nine, they, they learn, oh, I better keep my mouth shut in this situation, or I better act like this in this situation. So they learn how to cope with that. They understand how people are going to react to the higher the IQ, the more difficult it might be for the child to find someone to connect with socially. One reason why some of these kids are misidentified as um, autistic spectrum or what used to be called uh, Asperger's. Flip side to the high to a high IQ, these are some negative traits that some kids have. Asynchronous development, I'm sure you've heard that term, like disconnect between how you think, your mind, your body, you've got a, a four-year-old that you know can converse with an adult but has the experiences of a four-year-old, right? So there's going to be some disconnect there. Oversensitivity again, emotional issues. Friendships. A lot of gifted kids early on, particularly, 
they're very concerned with fairness because they see the big picture. Well, I did that, so they should do that. They think everyone else understands what they understand about social connections and game rules and things, and, and that's unfair. We should follow the structure, and why isn't everyone else following the structure, and I'm doing it, and this is horrible. Let's, I'm going to go home. So that's <laughs> very common as well. Self-esteem. Now, some gifted kids do have problems with self-esteem. Um, go back down. Now it could be, this is one of those things where it's not necessarily related to IQ, but we don't want to praise, they give a lot of focus to what kids accomplish. This is one, you know, I have different opinions about this. Oh, God, you got an A, get an A plus, get an A plus next time, you know. But we don't want to praise the, out, the, the final product, but the process. Gee, you really tried. What did you learn this time? So because if you praise the outcome, then they think, okay, well, I guess I'm a good person, but if I can praise for outcome, so I'm not going to try anything where I'm not going to get an A, because then I, people won't think I'm so great. So there are many books on this subject. I'm sure you know. Carol Dweck, D-W-E-C-K, has written books called Mindset. Most books have that word in it. Same thing. Uh, Alfie Cohen wrote a book called uh, Punished by Rewards. You know, you don't want to, well, I've done this myself in the other area, right? You know, you, well, you, you do, you know, don't overly emphasize the grades. You know, it's great, I'm proud of you, it's great. What'd you learn? You know, so if they try something that's hard, they didn't do it. Oh, wow, okay, next time, how are you going to approach that? Or, you know what, maybe that wasn't your thing. Let's try something else. So, again, this can be ameliorated in many instances by, by reading those kind of books, Carol Dweck and Melvin Cohen. And just don't praise the outcome, but praise their interest approached it and the process basically. Not satisfied with easy answer. Easy answer is where the baby comes from, for example. Uh, where do you go when you die? What do you mean? What, what is happening? And how does that work when babies? Remember, if, uh, my son asked me this question. And I gave him a very simple answer. Um, it, I'm trying to think, I'm sorry. The pot into my head. But he asked the question, I gave him a very simple answer. Oh, man and a woman uh, get together and they love each other and they have a baby. Okay, thanks. Six months later, well, what do you mean they get together and have, what happens after that? <laughs> well, let's see, well, they have to, they, they, they oh, okay, thanks. Then he asked a couple days, well, you said this, but that doesn't make sense. So yeah, you know, you have to go into some detail. They're not gonna say, okay, thanks, and ask you when they're teenagers, right? So they ask questions about those kind of things and life and death and existential questions early on. I've always tried with my kids just to be really honest with them and talk to them in a really honest way and not tell them fairy tales and you know, things in a way they can understand. I'm not sure. That's a good question. Some people think this, some people think that. Energy level, often very high, particularly boys, I don't know why. Perfectionism, again, same thing. Fear of failure because if they fail, it could be caused by a learned thing where I failed, but I didn't get that praise I'm used to. So, you know, we all want attention and recognition. And so sometimes that turns into perfectionism. Possible school issues, disengaged. They daydream. Why? Because they're not being engaged. Big picture thinkers. They're poor at rote memory, absent-minded professor. They understand things right away. I don't want to have to remember the math facts. I want to get right into geometry. So they don't like details or rote information. They want to understand things kind of all of it, all together, all of a sudden. Poor at handwriting, boys particularly. Why doctors writing? It's not a myth. I've seen it. Um, I you can't read my writing. I had to use a dictaphone before they had voice recognition software and uh, word processors. Um, prefer to do everything mentally. I hear this all the time. Why do I have to write it out? I did it. Here's their answer. Okay, so. Another good reason to test because it demystifies that and helps a teacher who knows what you she is doing to kind of accommodate for that. Okay. Roughly, so what do you do? Take an IQ test, what do you do with the information? Why take an IQ test? Most kids never need to have an IQ test. If they're going to school and they're engaged and they're doing well and they're happy and socially they're doing well and they have access to activities, fine. The only time you need to test is if you are not doing well because you need more remediation or because you're so far advanced the curriculum being taught is outside of the realm of the teacher to teach that in the grade that you are teaching so it's not about getting to the end the fastest right it's about making their school experience 
relevant to them and interesting and engaging so they don't turn off to school. Again, most people don't do that. 80%, 85%, 90% of kids never do that with IQ tests. I don't never push IQ testing. Um, but it can be very, very helpful for kids that don't fit into the norm. Most teachers can do very well with kids that are one or two years above grade level or one or two years below grade level. And if you haven't heard of the book by Susan Weinbrenner, Teaching Gifted Kids in the Regular Classroom, that's the book you should get. Uh, it's all kinds of ways to differentiate for gifted learners. It's good for parents to know too, so we can talk to teachers. I'm sorry. Also, they have kid, mental mates. Okay, so you want to find a place where kids can, can find other kids that think like them so they don't think they're weird and they don't turn themselves off and say, I'm just going to pretend that I don't know that stuff. Oh, there's other kids like me. Okay. Sometimes I test a child, they go to a camp or something, a program, and they just blossom because they found their team, you know, they found their buddies. Walls decline. A lot of kids, come, everything comes easily. You don't want that to necessarily be the case, right? Because they have to learn how to study because it's not going to always come easily to Everything's not going to always come easily to them. And if they say, I'm not going to try that because I can't do well at it and I don't want people to think I'm not smart, that's another issue, right? So that's why you have to no, try that. And not about getting aid, see how far you can get. Okay, how are you going to study for that next time? Who should we ask for some help? So they have to know what to do when things don't come easy. So that's why they, a lot of kids benefit from acceleration in some way or the neutral. Okay. Most kids with an IQ between 85 and 115 find in a general education setting. Um, most kids, or many kids with an IQ of roughly 115 to 130, they can do okay with it regular setting, but there's some things that you can do to supplement within class grouping. I'm going very quickly here. Uh, put the child in the teacher in the classroom with the teacher that knows how to differentiate using some of the strategies, for example, from that Susan Weinbrenner book, Teaching Gifted Kids in the Regular Classroom. Um, independent study opportunities, some self-directed learning, even if it's not for a grade, just for fun, you know, field trips. Of course, you want to do music and sports and social things. You know, academics isn't everything. That's just one thing. You want to be really well-rounded. Kids between 130 and 138 usually need or greatly benefit from some alternative programming. Again, multi-age classrooms, uh, replacement curriculum where they're taking math, for example, outside and during the school day. Instead of spending that hour learning fourth grade curriculum, they're doing their eighth grade geometry or trigonometry or whatever that they've learned somewhere else, but they're doing the, the practice part in class so they're not wasting their time in class. That's pretty common. The programs like this, right, where you come after school and, and they're with their mental mates and they're getting stimulation from the uh, Institute for Educational Advancement is one of those programs that is, works beautifully for these kids. Again, they're not wasting their time. Uh, you taught things they already know. And they're engaging with other kids that think like that. Single subject acceleration. You don't want to think about a one year grade skip. I there's a lot of research saying grade skipping is good if the child is well chosen and if the child feels good about it. I don't push it at all. I never recommend more than one year grade skip. And it's all mostly based on how the child feels socially. So, single subject acceleration is a good way to try that out. Let's, let's not put our second grader in third grade this year, but let's see if they can put him in third grade for math an hour a day to see how they are socially and how they feel. Hey, that worked great. Let's do the whole thing. Let's put it up one year. Uh, and a four-year grade skip is another one. 138 to 145. Again, grade skipping, these outside programs, summer camps, IEA type programs, um, all kinds of different. Oops, I'm sorry. There's another slide that didn't make it. Oh. This is it. Okay, so 135 or more, almost always, let's say 145 or more, they, they need to have something different. Okay, this is a good program here, right? IEA. There's also some, maybe heard of Davidson Institute. There are programs that specifically deal with highly gifted kids. 145, Davidson calls them profoundly gifted. Most people are exceptionally gifted. Davidson is an online program. It's a free program. If you make this cutoff, you used to have to take two tests in IQ and a comprehensive achievement test. Now you just have to take one or the other. You also just open up an online high school, Davidson. These are for profoundly slash exceptionally gifted kids. And many of them love it um, because 
again, is this too far outside of the norm for them to be accommodated in a regular environment? Early entrance, there's other. Once you get into secondary school, even 11 or 12 year olds sometimes can take college classes. Cal State LA, right here, right, has an early entrance program They're called Eusters. Early entrance. Um, they get as young as 11, 12, 13. Instead of going to high school, they put you in a pod with other kids and you go through college and instead of graduate, you know, 17, 18, 19 with a college degree and a high school degree at the same time. And then you can go on from there. And some kids love it. Early entrance program, you need an IQ test. And set a lot of criteria as well. So there are programs out there to meet the needs, including the IEA here, um, of these kids that really need this differentiation. Briefly, and then we'll go to uh, misdiagnosis. We talked about that, right? So this, these are the most common ways that kids are misdiagnosed. ADHD, it's been called ADD with, with that hyperactivity. I see this all the time. And sometimes, yeah, you can be gifted and have ADHD. What is ADHD? We don't know what it is. Like so many other disorders, it's a cluster of behaviors. We don't know what it is. Here, this medication seems to help. Okay, let's uh, give them that medication. You see trial and error that define these you know, solutions. Some people think it's a neuro, neurochemical imbalance, too much or too little serotonin, right? Um, so that's why uh, sometimes SSRIs work. Uh, stimulants work sometimes. There's different theories why they work, but um, I don't have time to get into it. Autistic spectrum disorders, Asperger's, some of these kids, particularly the ones that have IQs that are way up there, act and look different. They can't connect with other kids their age, and the misdiagnosis autistic spectrum disorder or Asperger's. But you identify them, you put them in with kids that are like them, they just boom, blossom. They're connecting with their kids, having conversations, they love it. So again, this is why these type of tests are very important for this very small set of kids, population of kids that need this differentiation. That's a book. You should get misdiagnosis and dual diagnosis of gifted children and adults. James Webb is one of the uh, editors. The Amazon for a few bucks use misdiagnosis and dual diagnosis. Some other interesting books, Gifted Children by Ellen Winner, who is, is or was Howard Gardner's Multiple Intelligence. This guy, um, married to him, I think. This is a great book. I think any one of these books, this would be the one to get as an overview. Mine is a very, it's more, Less information. This is more, that was more into the social aspects of giftedness. It's a very good book. And kids can read it too. When gifted kids don't have all the answers. Uh, yes, your teen is crazy, in case you have a teen. Um, this is based on research where we used to think that from like two to five, your brain's really blossoming, developing, and all this is happening, so you better get early intervention. Well, more recent research has found there's also a period of this great blooming of growth in the adolescent years, and that's why. Yeah, <laughs> know kind of not as he says insane sometimes right because you have they're, 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 they have new things going ahead that they haven't had before so they have to learn how to deal with it so he gives you some advice as to how to help them navigate through that explosive growth of different parts of their brain at that age and to talk to your kids for behavioral issues or just for to talk with them this is a great book counseling towards solution it's a very it's an approach if you want to look at, that's very, the child, if you're talking to the child, is the one that comes up with the solutions for him or herself. And so you say, well, you should try this and this. You talk them through so they come up with something for themselves and then they own it more, internalize it more. Um, it's a very good book if you have a child with behavior issues you're concerned about, the way to talk with them. To see if you can resolve it yourself. And we're at the end. So, any, uh, we'll get some questions. Could we get a copy of this one? I think that, uh, yes, yeah, I'm going to. Yes, I'm going to an announcement at the end. Right. But there was an online viewer who was curious mm -hmm. about um, any efforts made to identify underrepresented populations. But, yeah, that's been a big issue um, historically and legally. And that's why pretty much all districts that I've worked with do universal screening. So it used to be that only kids who had teacher recommendations or made certain cutoffs were screened with the OLSAT or a comprehensive IQ test. Now we do universal screenings. Um, everyone, doesn't matter, you know, what the teacher recommendation is or the parent interest is, everyone gets an OLSAT or an Eggly area. And most districts, too, that's the reason they do both of those tests. Typically, some just do one. They just do the Eggly area. 
and focus on the nonverbal um, IQ or ability because of second language issues. They're saying, well, gee, if we just if we account for verbal, we have a lot of second language issue. Second language kids are in our district. We're going to that's disadvantage to them. So let's just give the nonverbal test. Well, that's great, but some kids, as we just found out, are verbally gifted and some are non you know, perceptually gifted, right? So if you just give the negative area, that's also a problem. But um, if you get both, you're, you're, you're kind of looking at the whole population and identifying or capturing some of the kids with, that are second language learners that are gifted, but you're still losing some of those kids that speak, speak a different language because they may be verbally gifted in their language, but we're not testing that. So yeah, universal screening is what we use now to address that um, question. Any other questions? Yes. Sir. Do you provide uh, private services like uh, the testing? Yes, I do that. That's what I do is I just, that's all I do is testing and program referral. Come to me, it takes two hours. I test, I hand score it, I go over it with you at the um, session. I send you a report with a list of recommendations based on the score profile. If you have other needs like consultation, well, Sharon is very good. Sharon Duncan here is from Gifted Identity. She's in the area. She does more than I do as far as working with families. She knows all the programs in this area. So she refers people to me sometimes that need the test, and they take my test. Here's Sharon. Here's the test. Okay. And Sharon looks at it so I could, and uses my information and what she's gathered as well and uses that to help support her recommendations. Any other questions? Yes. Hey, um so you said like when you have a child that's doing well, like they really don't need like IQ testing. What if what if their siblings have been identified as profoundly gifted, but they are just that it's, just up, well, gonna, it's up to you. I mean okay? if your their siblings have been identified as profoundly gifted, there is more of a chance that they're going to be gifted. Um if some call it, but regression to the mean as well. Um, but if the child that hasn't been tested and is not in the programs is happy and socially doing well and is doing academically well and they have no interest in, hey, I want to go to that program that my sister is going to, no reason to test them, really. I don't see, you know, but sometimes I get, it's not that uncommon, I get a brother or a sister, uh, someone that I've tested two or three or four years ago, and I just did this a few weeks ago. They, uh, can you test the sister? She's always wondered about that since you tested her brother. And so I did you know, a couple weeks ago. And I don't like to do it just for that reason, but um, she also was able to access a couple of programs that she was interested in. But yeah, like I say, you don't need to. And do you find like, because um, I've been reading like girls mm -hmm. tried to kind of fit in and they. Yes. They don't. And so that was kind of a, it's, it's a daughter for us. That they're just blending well, or not it's anymore. possible but you know you by observation does you can see does she gravitate toward older kids does she have a passionate interest in self-teaching herself in certain areas that kind of thing now if she can access those older kids and self-teach in those areas without accessing these programs that it's not designed for gifted learners i would say no need to test her um, you know if she's asking for testing or is interested in these programs that you need the testing for then maybe test her Anyone else? Does, does the IQ test play any part at all in college admissions? No, 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 no it does all. not. In fact, okay. I, I would think that if you put, hey, and I got a really high IQ and I was in Mensa, that might be a turnoff. You know, <laughs> they, <laughs> I mean, they, they want to see what you've done. Right, right. right. My question, I guess, is more in line with, um, so I homeschool my kids, and so. Um, with my daughter, I'm thinking of going a very creative route because right. it's becoming so combative. Right. Um, so I just wondered if we do something very creative, would that at all help? Anybody? Well, that might help more than an IQ test. Now, the IQ test might give her access to programs where she can really uh, move forward academically okay. and then do much better on her SATs. Uh, so in that sense, if she's interested, uh, and you think that some of her strengths are academic and, and she would benefit from these academic oriented programs for gifted kids, then that might be beneficial. Okay. Yes. Thank you. What is the best option to educate these kids? There's no best option. I don't recommend private over public. Some publics are much better than some privates. It depends on the teacher in the classroom and the administrative support, support they receive and the training that they have received. Public schools do have, you know, you have to have a credential to teach a K 
gifted class in public schools, typically you need certification, so they have some training. Private schools have their own criteria. Some are as good as or better than public schools. Some are very lax. So it's a, it just depends on the teacher in the classroom mostly and the administrative report they receive, support that they receive. There's so many, Sharon knows better than I, but I, I think you can do have a great education in a public school with some supplementation. But homeschooling is also great for many different reasons with some supplementation. You know, again, this, that's why this place is really good because you can come here as part of a homeschool program or after school and public school program. Um, so there is no one ideal. And if you get somebody telling you that there is, then they have an opinion, but that's not necessarily right for you. Another question. Um, does the IQ score change with the age? Uh, it's not supposed to. It's supposed to stabilize. It's fairly stable at four and a half, five, and very stable. After eight or so, the test is given right. So if you have an IQ, you know, 120 at eight or nine, it's probably going to be around there, plus or minus five to eight points at 30 and 50. If the higher IQ you will have, the more likely it is you're going to have those. You know, you're way up at 145 at eight years old, you're probably going to still be in that range somewhere in down the, you know, as an adult. Right. It's supposed to test innate abilities, not what you've learned. But some of the sections of IQ tests, like the verbal section, can be influenced by learning. If you read a lot passionately, a high, high language environment, your parents you know, speak with high level language, have a lot of books around, and that, that will enhance the verbal section of the IQ test. But the other sections are more innate ability. It's hard to train for that. With an IQ test, um, can you create a, any type of IEP or something like that in the regular schools or in the charter schools? You mean if you're gift, if you're gifted, yeah. gift. well, every school does something different. Some private schools have um, they call it ILPs. Sometimes individual learning pl plans. IEPs are typically for special education uh, students, but I think some schools do call uh, specialized plans for gifted learners IEPs as well. It's not to, it's just not standardized. Okay. But typically, in a, in a public or private school, yes, you can access different programs. In public, it's gifted and talented education it used to be called talented mm -hmm. and gifted tag. Um, Still is in parts of the country, and and some programs are great, some aren't so great. Mm -hmm. Depends on the individual school. Okay, but it's good to supplement on the outside as well. Yes. There's a, there's a private school open in Pasadena. It's called uh, Old Christ Academy for gifted and talented children. Mm -hmm. They use the Sage or tool to if you know check the mm -hmm. kids if they are gifted or not. So what is the SAGE? What's the defense from that we talked about today? I'm not quite sure. SAGE is not, not a comprehensive. S-A-G-E. It might be their own test. It's not a standardized test. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't ring a bell as far as a, a comprehensive. See, there's a program in Orange County where my private practice is based. I live in Long Beach, but I have a private practice in, in uh, Laguna Beach. That Pegasus School, and they're very good, I think. But they don't use IQ testing either, but they, they say they're for gifted learners, but they have their own test. But if you look at their test, you know, they're good tests, but they're, look, they're really screening out. Kid, they're looking at kids like motor skills, right? Fine motor skills and developmental skills, okay? Those don't always go with IQ, right? As we've discovered, you get a really poor fine motor skills and they have IQ off the charts. So they're missing a lot of kids there. A lot of gifted kids are not perfect students, they're not like high achieving students. Teachers want high achieving students. They don't necessarily want gifted students because they're very bothersome, right? <laughs> <laughs> they, they, want to do, they need too much stimulation. They don't fit in, right? They ask too many questions. They're, they're too active. Some of them have these flip side issues, the attentional issues, the uh, writing issues. It, if you go to a good gate program, you're going to see a lot of these kids. You go, are these, are they, you know? This is from Edo class or is this system? <laughs> because you see a lot of these very blatant, but they get off the charts with their reasoning ability. So that's why they need uh, higher level reasoning um, com and complexity in the program, not just here's more paperwork to do and do these you know, five books and come back tomorrow. Any other questions? Okay, I'll hang out here for a while if you do want to talk so to me. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, recording will be available on our Facebook at IEA Gifted in case you feel like you missed anything, want to rewind, um, and also on our YouTube channel.
Um, if you would like to avail of Dr. Palmer's services, please visit his website, which is palmerlearning.com. He also has a book out, which is Parents' Guide to IQ Testing and Gifted Education. So um, I also recommend that book. Um, did you bring some today, Dr. I brought some cards, but not a book. Okay. Um, and then if you would like a copy of the PowerPoint, please send me an email. My business cards are over there by the stairs. Um, our next gifted support group meeting is November 15th, um, hosted by Bonnie Raskin, who is our Caroline G. Bradley Scholarship Manager. Um, she'll be going over uh, finding the right school fit for your gifted middle school child. Okay? Thank you so much, and thank you for our live stream audience. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, how are you? I never met you.